Hey everyone, it's me, host Brianna Whitney. Before we launch another serialized season on the podcast, we're going to be releasing other episodes that range from one-on-one interviews to other cases we've been working on or looking into. This episode is fascinating. Our team wanted to find out what truly goes on in an interrogation of a suspect, especially on the most violent of crimes. How do detectives get them to crack? I sat down with retired homicide and violent crimes detective Roger Geisler, who worked at Glendale PD in Arizona for decades. I could seriously listen to him talk about his career for hours. It's that interesting. We don't normally get an inside look at tactics like this, So take a listen to what truly goes on in those interrogation rooms. This is True Crime Arizona, the podcast. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. So give the listeners a little bit of your background, your name, your title, and what you spent your policing career doing. So my name is Roger Geisler, and I my policing career involved uh, investigations. Um, I was an investigator from 1993 up until 2017 when I retired as a cold case homicide detective. Uh, from 93 until then, I mean, that's a long time. I've done anything from auto theft and forgery to uh, sex crimes, children crimes, and of course, homicide and cold case homicide. So I, I've done quite a bit in my career. What stands out? as being a homicide detective when it comes to investigations, especially ones that are high profile? Oh boy. Yeah, high profile cases are, 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 are a little bit different than just your normal run of the mill, you know, you got a dead guy and somebody shot him. Uh, high profile cases involve a lot more uh, work, a lot more research, um, a lot of information that you have to gather and obtain before you do the actual interview or interrogation of the person. So you want a lot of background. So I want to talk about interrogating a suspect because we always hear about suspect interviews in our investigations ourselves and our cases that we cover. But I feel like there's so much more that goes into that than really I or the public knows. Um, For you, when it comes to a, let's say a homicide suspect, let's just start with that. Is there truly a good cop, bad cop, thing that goes on that people hear about that's in movies or is that kind of fictional and does it go a whole lot differently i i I, yeah it's not really it's not really fictional those things used to happen way back in the in the older days you know where where you'd get the 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 big bright light you put them on it and you were trying to build the anxiety up and get them to confess and everything And, and things have progressed and changed a lot since then and what's helped in that progression is the evidence that we can gather nowadays as back in those days. Um, The stuff that we gather now, we have a lot more information when we go into an interview, whether that be through social media or through photographs or videos or all these things that take effect. And so we know a lot more details when we go in to talk to somebody. So there's no real brow beating or, 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 uh, you know, demeaning the person or anything like that. It's more of a conversation with that person um, and getting them to talk about what happened. Uh, For me and a lot of investigators, I think we want to know why it happened. Because when we get to that point where we're going to talk to somebody, we kind of know what happened. You know, you've done all that research and that background. It's It's a question of why did this happen? What prompted it to happen? You know, what were the circumstances? And so that's kind of what we're going on. So how do you get them to talk or open up? Uh, You know, it's funny, a a detective once told me, you catch more bees with honey, and that's exactly it. I think the majority of the people want to be treated with respect. They want to be talked to like a normal person. Even the heinous crimes, I mean, I've talked to people that have done really some gruesome things, and yet you go in and you're just a human with them, you know, one-on-one. I want to talk to you about what happened, you know, I'm not demeaning you, I'm not playing any games you know we're just we're just there to talk and most people really respond to that they just want to talk to you as a regular person how do you deal with that though knowing what you know about somebody especially if it's some of the most gruesome crimes the sex crimes or killing children anything that you've had knowledge of that I know you've worked on how do you do that and talk to somebody as a normal person that's almost an equal in that moment even though you know they've done these 
horrific things. Hey, you know, it's funny when you, when you're a detective and people know that you're working homicide or, or sex crimes or dealing with children. The first thing a lot of people will tell you is, oh, I couldn't do that because if I did that, I just want to shoot the person. And it's not like that. It's it's like when I'm interviewing or when I'm talking to somebody, in the, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about the victim and the victim's family and what they want out of this conversation. They want to know the same things I want to know. Why did this happen? What prompted this person to do this? Because I'm giving the family answers, answers to why their loved one was molested or why their loved one was uh, murdered, you know, those things. And that's a lot of what it is. You know, there is obviously the court component. Yes, I want to know what happened. We, I want to be able to articulate that. Um, in detail in court, but you know, those other reasons in the back of my mind, you know, when you say, well, how can you do that? Well, because that's what I'm thinking. You know, I'm just there to have a conversation with this person, the best conversation I can have to gain the most accurate and, and truthful information that I can. I think a lot of times we hear, oh, these people don't say a word. They're silent or they say, I'm, you know, I want, need my attorney present or I'm not going to say anything. How often is it that you get suspects or people of interest who do come forward with information or talk to you versus those who stay silent? So, and that's, as an investigator, that's, that's a, a line you have to understand your legal implications when you're interviewing people. You know, um, sometimes uh, people will say, things like, you know, I just don't want to talk to you, you know. So we have to understand what is an invocation, what is something that I can't really go any further than what I've already gone. And so those are all things we take into account when we are talking to people. Um, you know, obviously they read their rights. Um, everybody has those rights. And we, so we, we offer that to everybody we speak to. And it's up to them to make that decision. And, and it's funny because a lot of times you will have people ask you, well, what should I do? I'm not sure what I should do. And as an investigator, I can't give them advice. I can't. What do you say? I, I basically explain, this is your decision, okay? Um, they understand, I, I, I let them understand where I'm coming from. This is, my, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I need to do. It's your decision whether or not you speak to me. If you think that you need an attorney, that's your decision. Um, I just can't make those decisions for them. Most of the time, people will think about it and they will speak to me. Um, but there are those occasions where they say, you know what, I think I'm going to wait. I think I'm going to uh, talk to an attorney a and we're done. Why do you think it's you they cho choose to open up to? I mean, what do you do that that makes them feel like you're this safe space to even maybe come clean to? There are, there are investigators out there. There are good investigators and then there are investigators that maybe aren't as good. And sometimes it's a connection. And that's all it is. Um, I can walk into a room and it be a, a young man or, you know, somebody who looks at me maybe as their a father figure. You know, it's just that connection that you have when you approach. It's your demeanor. It's the way you speak to people. Um, there have been interviews where I couldn't get anywhere. The person will talk to me. I just couldn't get them to open up. And yet another detective may come in and they tell them everything. It's really, you know, people just have that connection or that way with people um, to get them to open up and talk. Is there a certain question that you like to go to in an interview that seems to resonate with people? I don't really have any, any real questions. Uh, what I find works best for me is honesty. You know, I explain to them, this is why I'm here. Because this was reported or this is what I know. I'm asking you, I would like to talk to you about it. You know, I read them their rights and ask them to tell me about it. It's more of being honest with them. You know, I'm not trying to play games. I'm not trying to trick you into something. I just want to know what happened. And it seems to, for me individually, it seems to work out better. You know, I'll offer them a drink of water. I'll, I'll you know, um, I've, <laughs> I've given people an opportunity to smoke, you know, all those things that, you know, make them feel like they're, they're just as human as I am, you know, and I'm not going to look down upon them to uh, as to what they did because I just want to know what happened. Let's talk about some of the individual cases that you were telling me about. Uh, Raymond Sawyer, do you want to talk about that one? Because that was a 
crazy one for you. Yeah, yeah. So Raymond Sawyer was a gentleman who, back in 1981, um, his wife was discovered in North Phoenix in a, in a lot, uh, like a ho- new housing development lot, um, and she was she was deceased. Um, the scene at the time appeared to look like she was murdered. And so uh, detectives came out, they began to investigate. They went to her house and found Mr. Sawyer at the home. And his story at the time was his wife had gone to work that day and then after work she was going to the mall and then she she just hadn't arrived home yet. And this was late, kind of late in the evening. And so the officers discovered her car out on the roadway with a flat tire. At the time, that case kind of went cold. They didn't really get anything. They got some fingerprints from the car. Um, they did some work on the tire, the flat tire and, and different things. It kind of went cold. Uh, when I picked up the case in 2007, I started looking at it, looking at the evidence, look, reading through the case, coming up with kind of an idea of what's going on. And it was, it was interesting in the fact that the, the information was, there, there was a rope tied around her neck and the rope was tied in a knot that was not a slip knot. So it couldn't get tighter as if to strangle her. So I thought that was a little odd. Looking at the car, the tire, the flat tire had a nail in it. But what was interesting is that nail was put into the tire in a direction that the tire or the car would have been going in reverse. So we know the car's not driving reverse down the road to get a nail in the tire. Right. So I thought that was odd. And then the fingerprints, the the technician at the time, and this is 1981, the fingerprint technician described the fingerprints as being in the dust, which tells me that those prints were pretty recent because had the car been all day, you know, Arizona's a pretty dusty place, we would expect uh, dust to be kind of over the prints. So I thought, okay, so those are pretty fresh prints. Well, the prints turned out to be his prints. With all these things, I thought, okay, well, we need to go talk to him. I need to understand the story again because that's commonly what we'll do. Uh, Myself and another detective went to Colorado. We met with him at his his house. Um, He agreed to come into the station and I explained to him, I just want to talk to you about your wife's case or your your deceased wife's case because he was remarried and and talk to him about it. So he came in, kind of told me the same exact story he told in 1981, all the way down to he didn't know anything until the police came and told him that she was deceased. Um, explained his relationship with her as a good relationship. I left the interview room, kind of formulated a, a, an idea how I was going to explain everything to him. And I went back in and I, I started with the rope. And I explained to him that, you know, now, as opposed to 1981, we have DNA. And I was there to get some, some swaps from him, a DNA sample, in order to um, eliminate him from anything that, any of the evidence that we might have collected. And so you I ta- use the word eliminate? Eliminate, Does, yeah. Do you think that made him feel it, it better have, in that moment? It could have, but we do you do that a lot to eliminate people because the more people you can eliminate, the better you can get down to the person who uh, committed the crime. So I talked to him about that, and I explained to him how rope really holds DNA in the rope because your little uh, skin cells and stuff will break off into the rope. So we talked about that. I talked about the tire and how I felt like this car isn't driving down backwards. And then we talked about the fingerprints. And he said, well, uh, as I understand, those are my fingerprints. Yes, they are your fingerprints. But then I described them as in the dust. He paused for a few minutes. Um, it got real quiet, real silent. Um, he bowed his head and he says, Mr. Geisler, he said, what's going to happen to me today if I confess? And at that point, I knew he wanted to talk about it. And so I explained to him the truth. The truth of the matter is, when we're all done here, you're free to go home. There's nothing I can do. I mean, I just want to have this conversation with you. And at that point, he laid the whole thing out, how his wife came home that evening. Um, She was going to go out. They were were having some some issues between the two of them. But she was going to go out, dinner or drinks or something that night, made him angry. And he ends up murdering her at the home and then taking her body out, placing her in the car and, and everything, setting everything up. Uh, we got done. He left to go home. Um, he was going to go tell his wife, his new wife at that time, what had happened. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty fun. Um, and then I, of course, went out and I was there on another case also. The interesting thing was, is I got a phone call from him through the Colorado Police Department. Um, 
wanting to talk to me, so I answered the phone. And it was very interesting because he wanted to thank me for allowing him the opportunity to talk about what happened. And I had asked him, I said, well, you know, what changed your mind? And his whole thing was, when the, when the detectives came to my house that night, they were mean to me. I said, well, how were they mean to me? They were accusing me of killing my wife. And the way they acted and their demeanor, they were very hard on him. And he says, you allowed me to come in here and tell my story. He says, and, and that, that meant something to him. For, for me, that was really important to allow him to give that information to me. Um, of course, shortly after that, I came back to Phoenix and, you know, we got a filing against him. And of course, he, he went he was later sentenced to uh, prison. So it but that but that just shows you how, you know, things have changed in all these years on how we interview people, you know, and how, like I said, back in those days, you know, it was like slamming the book on the table or what you see on TV is is kind of similar to how things were, but it's not like that anymore. An interesting point you made during that, and it's a fascinating story. Um, you said you started talking to him, then you left, then you came back in and started to talk about each piece of evidence or things that you knew. Do you play your cards when you talk to people like this? Knowing what you know, do you tell them you know all of this? And, and how do you do that? Do you start up front? Do you gradually go into it? Do you never show your cards? Well, a lot of times what I like to do is talk to people first and let them tell me everything they want to tell me and everything that they have for me, because it does help me formulate questions I might have. Uh, the one thing I, I don't like doing is interrupting people. Nobody likes to be interrupted. So by listening to everything, they can, I can formulate how I want to approach them or how I want to ask them questions. Um, and that just helps a long way down the road. And then that way, when I come back in, I can say, okay, let me explain. I heard your story. I know what you've told me, but this is what I know. And now based on what I know, what you told me, it's not kind of lining up a little bit. So let's talk about this further. And of course, you know, after telling him everything that I knew in the case, I think he kind of figured, you know, you know kind of you got me thing uh, and that's when he bowed his head and and asked me what would happen to him you know i find it interesting too we, we know the technology has changed which obviously changes what you guys can know in an investigation but what do you think it was with the demeanor change in terms of that kind of good cop bad cop tell me what you know to to now because obviously it wasn't just technology that's changed that it's maybe a whole societal change too it, a societal change, but I think it's a change, a, a training change, a, a learning change over many years with investigators and how we approach people. It's more, I want to say it, it, it could be human behavior, but I'm not sure it's really that. It's its more the people that are becoming investigators are more, um, you know, more cognizant of the person that they're talking to and how to treat people. You know, we have uh, even officers on the street. I know that many times I would come up to people when I was on the street for that short period of time, I would come up and people would talk to me only because I treated them nice. You know, um, they may have been sitting for 20 minutes, you know, and they're just tired. Okay, we'll stand up, you know, let, let's talk about this a little bit. And people just want to, they want to talk. They want to tell you their story. It's just, how are you going to allow them to do that? And then how are you going to allow them afterwards to hold their head high. I want to talk about the Jesse Shockley case too. That was a huge high profile case here. Um, just for people who don't know, can you give us just the basics of the case? And then we'll lead up to the interviews with her mom. Yeah, Jerice Hunter was uh, mo the mom of Jesse Shockley, who was five years old at the time. Um, her mom reported her missing. And then throughout the course of the investigation, we learned that, in fact, Jesse had been abused by juries in the home. And then when she became missing, learned later that she wasn't actually missing. Her mom disposed of her in the trash. So that was the case. Um, but during that, yes, she was interviewed a couple of times uh, over what was going on. And the interesting thing about that case was she, Jerice, was very public, was you know, yelling out at people and was angry on camera if anybody accused her of being involved. I mean, she was 
on TV talking about this and find my baby and this and that. So how do you go about interviewing somebody like that who you end up finding this evidence or this information that points them in the direction of this is our prime suspect and we have evidence against them, but they're publicly going out there and saying they don't do this. So clearly they're outspoken. How do you deal with that? So it's, it's funny. Anybody who's a parent who has small children, think of it when you approach your child and you know they've done something and you tell them, did you do this? And what's the first thing they do? They deflect, right? Especially if they have siblings. Well, you know, so-and-so did that. This is kind of the same premise. You know, Jerice um, reported her child missing. A family knew something more was going on at the time and she was being accused of doing something. Um, so it, the best way to do it, even by the police, because now we're involved and we're asking her questions and we're you know, trying to get information from her, what's the best way to do it? And that's deflect. And so by going out to the media and saying, well, the police department's not doing anything and making it a, a race issue and making all the, it's just deflecting the heat away from her. And that's kind of what was going on. So we, we did have to deal with that and it was a, a struggle. Um, even when, when her mom came out and was saying some things that, that, that made it difficult for us to do our investigation, you know, um, having conversations about, hey, you know, we need to kind of hold that back a little bit. So we, we would like people to call us and give us, you know, uh, information about what they know or what they, they may have seen. And so sometimes that does make it difficult. Um, but Jerice ma- maintained throughout that um, her daughter went missing. She maintained her story throughout um, for the little bit of time that, that you know, that happened. Um, I know that uh, I, you know, she was attempted to talk to interview uh, near the last time, but that, of course, she exercised her rights. She doesn't have to talk. And so that does make it a little difficult. But again, like you said, with the changes in technology and, and information from other sources, we were able to put that together. Do you feel like you ever got through to juries on a personal or personable level? No, not at all. I, I just think she's she's one of those people that just wasn't going to just wasn't going to give the information that was needed. And not for me, okay? I you know, yes, that was an important case to me, especially with Jesse. But I think the information was more important for the other family members, the people that actually raised her and took care of her. I think for for Jerice, you know, maybe someday she'll she'll come forward and, and you know, say she's sorry and exactly what happened, uh, but who knows. How frustrating is it for you to work on a case like that and never get the person that, you know, was eventually convicted of the murder to open up and just admit it? Right. Or right. at least at least come forward with more information. Exactly. And and that is frustrating. It is extremely frustrating because, you know, you have the, the, the public that wants to know. You know, you have family members that want to know. And unfortunately, your only source of information won't tell you. And so it's a matter of putting these pieces together and giving the family, okay, well, this is what we believe happened. This is everything the evidence shows happened, you know, from other uh, witnesses and people who talked. And that's, that's the best we can do. What do you think the biggest misconception is that the public or people have of policing, of investigations, of interrogations, all of those components that they might see in the movies or on TV or even just think they know versus what actually happens? Well, you know, TV <laughs> TV has definitely changed the perspective on what police do and what, and what we know. I think for the public, you know, their, their expectations are is that, you know, everybody's going to talk to us and everybody's going to confess and we're going to get them to go right to jail. And it, it just doesn't happen that way. It doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes people may confess, but there isn't enough evidence. I mean, there just isn't enough. And so it, it just makes it very difficult. Okay. How has psychology or the awareness of mental health changed the way that you interrogate somebody? Okay, so when we, when we talk mental health, it, it, it does change some things. Um, there was a case back in 2005 um, where a gentleman uh, did a shooting at Walmart. And uh, in order to do that, in order to do that interview, okay, I want to know more about him. And, you know, sometimes it, things are moving such at a rapid pace that you don't have time to gather everything you want to gather in order to make that interview. 
But going to his home and seeing his home, looking at his yard, is he the type of person that keeps things up? Is he, you know, what kind of person is this? And sometimes that that psychological stuff that you see does help in the does help in the interview. You know, is this person uh, diminished in any way? You know, and sometimes that that interview that we do before we actually ask questions sometimes is just to determine whether or not they're going to be able to understand what I'm asking them. Because I think that's, you know, just like children, we read their rights differently than we do an adult. We explain each right to a child where we don't with adults. But there have been times during interviews where I've actually read the juvenile rights only because I think that maybe the adult doesn't understand and I want them to understand the best possible that they can. So it's just a way of evaluating people, you know, it, it's like you and I, you know, if we meet for the first time, we're going to kind of size each other up. We're going to listen to how we speak and then we're going to know how to approach each other. How different, just since you brought it up, how different is uh, trying to get a child to open up versus an adult? Well, nowadays, you know, with, especially with younger children, we have forensic interviewers that that do that. Even in the Jesse Shockley case, we used an FBI forensic interviewer with the other children. Um, and they have techniques or ways that they speak to children that are different than I. Okay. And, uh, you know, so they can get them to open up, you know, um, but there is a process to that. And it, again, it's a, a rapport building process, just like adults, you know, I want somebody to feel comfortable talking to me. So usually we'll talk about things before the actual interview starts. So it's just a way of trying to make them understand that I'm just like them. You know, I'm just a person, you know, trying to obtain information. How often do people invoke their right to stay silent? Uh, it, that does happen occasionally. I mean, would you say 50-50? Would you say even more? I, I wouldn't say 50-50. You know, it's, it's, a li- it's probably less than 50%, only because, again, a lot of people want their story to come out. They want, they want family members to know, I'm not this bad person. This happened, but I'm not this horrible person that goes around just killing people, you know, or just molesting people, you know. This is a one-time happen, and, and sometimes they just want, you know, to be able to explain. And it may be an excuse, but it's still just a way of explaining it. Can you remember an interrogation where it was easier than you thought it was going to be to get somebody to be forthcoming. I can. Um, it, it was what, what was very funny is we had, I, I happened to be in the station one morning and I was standing in our 911 dispatch and they had a call come in and a gentleman called up the, the police saying, um, I just killed my wife. Wow. Well, I know that that interview is going to be very easy since he's already confessed. And so we, you know, it was later on, they, they went out and yes, we, we arrested him. Um, he, his wife was deceased in the home and yeah, tell me what happened. And off he went, just told me everything that occurred. So sometimes there are those, you know, that are super easy. Especially given that it's 2022 and there's been a lot of divide among people in the last few years. Does race ever play a part in how you question somebody or how you interrogate a suspect or person of interest? For me, no. And and I'll tell you why. Like Like I said before, I'm a person just like them, okay? I have a job, they have a job. You know, it's just part of what we're there for. Um, Again, for me, it's, I treat you with respect. It's all I ask in return. And I'm just there to get answers for the family, you know? and that's just the easiest way to handle it. But, but yeah, I, I don't, I've never seen in my career where races come into it. It's always streamlined, at least for you. It's always streamlined, at least for me. Yeah, you know, where it's just, like I said, it's just person to person. You know, I don't have anything against, you know, that person for what, even what they did, I don't. I'm there to get information so I can report back to the families and give closure to those who need it. How often is a person hostile with you? Oh, you you know, it's it's funny. A lot of times they can be. They can come into the interview room um, a little angry, uh, depending on how they were arrested, you know. But again, it's it's making them feel at ease. Say, you know, what's done is done. I'm there now to just talk to you, just have a conversation. You know, if they want to talk to me, they can. If they don't, they don't. You said something interesting earlier that I want to follow up on. 
you said that sometimes people will admit to what they did, but they don't want family or friends or even the public to think they're a bad person, that maybe this crime is separate from the person they truly are. Do you find that excuses are given out a lot as to why something occurred to try to explain or defend their actions as opposed to who they think they really are? Yeah, I I think that happens occasionally, you know, but again, it's about saving face, having that respect, not losing that respect. You know, there are, I, I mean, maybe a couple of times in my career where people believe they've made a mistake. You know, it's, this is not the person I am. I just had a moment of anger or whatever. Um, and so, you know, that's that's kind of what they want to come out. But then, of course, you talk to other people and, you know, you learn other information that may not be consistent with that. But again, it's, it's, it's just people want to tell the truth. I think the majority of the people want to tell the truth. It's just how is that truth going to come out? It's interesting because you spent so many years interviewing probably some of the worst people that people would consider you know these are people that have committed violent crimes but hearing you talk about it i can hear the passion um behind it in your career do you miss it at all now that you've retired (laughs) from this part of your i i I do i do miss it (laughs) i miss it a lot um i really enjoy talking to people you know i i enjoy looking at cases and seeing especially the older cases the missing kid cases those cases that that the families really need that closure you know i talked to i still talk to detectives where i've worked with the glendale police department um I talk to detectives about, and we, we talk over cases because, you know, it's important as a detective is not to keep everything to yourself. You have to talk to other detectives because that gives you ideas on who to talk to or, or how to approach people. And, and so we, we still have those discussions in order to move those cases forward for the families. Do you think in the next 10, 20 years, there will be another big shift in how people are interviewed? I mean, we had the big shift from the 70s and the 80s, you know, tell me what you know, all that to to where it is now. Do you see it continuing to evolve and maybe how? I don't don't think the, the interview itself will change at this point. I think treating people the way we should be treating them uh, won't change. I think that, you know, the innovations and evidence and stuff like that that's coming forward is going to make that an easier process. You know, if you see yourself on camera doing a crime, it's kind of hard to say, I didn't do that. Right. <laughs> it, and again, it goes back into why did it happen? You know, is there a reason? What, what do you want me to portray to the public or to the family as to why this happened. And that's the most important, I think. How does isolation play a role in interviewing somebody? Maybe somebody in solitary confinement, somebody who's been by themselves. Does it change the dynamic if they haven't had social interaction? So I've I've never interviewed anybody in isolation. Okay, so most of the people that we interview um, or that I've interviewed, um, you know, they're either brought from the scene in a police car and they're put in in a interview room for, you know, maybe an hour, you know, they might be there. But again, even during that time, they're checked on, they're given water, you know, whatever they need and try to make them comfortable. Is there anything you want the community or the public to know about this profession and the way that you carry yourself as a detective, as a homicide investigator that people either don't know or might have a misconception about? I haven't seen any misconceptions, but I think the public needs to understand that, you know, every interview is bound by a set of rules and those are are legal rules, um, you know, and how people talk to us. So sometimes we may not have all the answers that the public wants, you know, from us. And so sometimes that, that does make it difficult. Why do you think interrogation videos are so interesting to the public? So many people like to see those surveillance cameras and listen to the questions. Why do you think that is? I think it's because, it, depending on the type of crime, people want to know the answers. And again, when you're going back to interviewing people, I'm there to get answers for the family, for the public, for closure. And I think that's the most important thing. People want to know, is this person who's talking about a murder a monster or are they just somebody who lost control had a moment of anger 
are they the person that wants to go out and hurt people or are they the person who, again, just did it? And there are those two different types of people. There are those two different types of people. Absolutely. Have you ran across a monster or somebody you would consider to be a monster? I have ran into, that's a, that's a, that's a tough question. I have run into people who were not nice at all. Okay. I can't say they're a monster. You know the truth as an investigator. The public knows the truth. It's all seen, but that person doesn't take responsibility. I consider that person kind of a mean person because you know what? I mean, the public needs to know what happened or why it happened. And so that's just, you know, to me, that's, that's probably the worst. What would you consider that person? If they're not a monster, would you just consider them a bad person? A bad person, yes. And they exist? Oh, they exist, yeah. How many people in your investigations do you believe were bad people compared to those who just snapped and made a mistake? Yeah, I can't give you a number, but I have run into those those bad people in the past, yes. Would you say a lot? A few. A few. <laughs> So you interrogate somebody on a terrible crime and you're analyzing quite literally everything about them. You're so focused on it. You're listening to what they're saying, the psychological effect of that. And then you leave and go home to your family and, and are a normal person outside the police station. How do you deal with that? So if, if you look at me, you can see that I'm kind of overweight. Okay. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Uh, you deal with you deal with horrible things as a police officer or even a detective. You see horrible things. You talk to people who do horrible things. And so when you separate yourself from that, there is an amount of stress. And of course, with stress comes eating because that's, that's comfort. And so when you see a lot of these officers and people like me who, you know, 30 years, 33 years on and you're overweight, there's a reason. A lot of times there have been times where, you know, I would go home and maybe I wouldn't sleep or I'd lose sleep or you think about, especially cases that um, you go out to the scene and it's a horrific scene and yet you don't have a person in custody or you haven't spoken to anybody. Um, sometimes those are some of the worst cases. I know with Jesse Shockley, I've, I lost quite a bit of sleep along with some other detectives um, because it was a missing child. And so those things absolutely take a toll on the investigators. And also your family. Uh, do you talk to them about these cases? I do. So I've, I've been married for about 20, 28 years. And, you know, my wife and I, we talk about a lot of things. And I think that's good for investigators to do, although there has to be a limit in that. You can't dwell on it. You can't talk about it forever or, or things. You know, um, if you do need help, you reach out to other people. There are other resources for investigators. Uh, but for myself, yeah, I would, you know, I would talk about things with my wife to a certain degree. And then that was it then we move on with our lives. And so I think that's the main thing as an investigator. Did that take years to learn how to navigate that and kind of properly process and deal with that outside of work? Yeah, I mean, as an, investig as an investigator, you know, doing the, these, t especially these violent crimes, it does affect your family. I, I won't say it doesn't because, you know, there's times where you're sitting in a movie theater and the call comes in and you're leaving your family at the movie theater to go to a call. So it does interrupt your holidays, your birthdays, you know, your kids stuff. It's just, you have to make it a balance. And so I was able to do that with my family. Thank goodness. A lot of violent crimes occur late at night when my children are asleep. So, you know, <laughs> that, kind of lucky there, but, but yeah, so it, it's just those type of things. It's just a, a fine balance. And, and I'm, you know, I'm fortunate that I had a supporting family and I was able to balance all of that with my life. Has it been different for your family now that you're retired from homicide and investigative work? Well, of course, my children are older now and they're moved out, but uh, yeah, it is It is different. Um, for me, I do miss the call outs. I mean, that sounds crazy, you know, getting called out at one in the morning, but I miss the, the, the interesting things that you get to know and get to learn and get to do. So I do kind of miss that, but yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a change. 
What's your thought on the public's interest in crime and true crime and so many people wanting to learn more about cases? It seemed like the the interest in true crime and, and particularly even maybe gruesome cases has increased over the years. Why do you think that is? I think people are just really interested in it, you know, really interested in the technologies and the way things are done and, and all the, the innovations in how to do it. You know, we get some of the most horrific crimes or interesting crimes and the technology that goes into those things is just amazing. And I think that's, that is interesting for a lot of people. True Crime Arizona, the podcast, is hosted by me, Brianna Whitney, and produced by Sergio Hernandez. It's a production of Arizona's Family, 3TV, CBS5, and azfamily.com in Phoenix, Arizona. Looking for a new career? Welcome to Do HVAC Training Service Center in North Charleston. Enroll today in our comprehensive HVAC training hands-on field experience-based program covering troubleshooting, maintenance, installation, and more on various HVAC systems and ductwork. We offer EPA and NAIT preparation and testing along with various certifications. Enjoy payment options. Achieve certification in under five months. Enroll now for your new journey of skill development and career advancement. Log on to DEWHVACTrainingSC.com to inquire.